Mr. President, distinguished members of the court, it is a privilege to appear on behalf of the Gambia in this case of exceptional importance. It is my task to address the circumstances leading to this urgent request for provisional measures under Article 41 of the Statute of the Court and to examine the evidence that is before you. Yesterday marked 71 years since the United Nations adopted the Genocide <coughs> Convention. On 9 December 1948, in the shadow of the Holocaust, the world said never again. Yet, in Srebrenica, Rwanda, Darfur, and many other sites of sorrow, we have witnessed again and again humankind's failure to prevent genocide. We appear before you today because there is still time to save the Rohingya. We turn to this court as the guardian of the Genocide Convention to prevent their further destruction at the hands of Myanmar. In its order of 8 April 1993 in Bosnia versus Serbia, the court noted that whether or not past genocidal acts may be imputable to them, states parties to the convention are under a clear obligation to do all in their power to prevent the commission of any such acts in the future. In granting provisional measures in that case, it concluded that there was a grave risk of acts of genocide being committed. That, Mr. President, is exactly the conclusion of the UN Independent International Fact-Finding Mission on Myanmar. In its report of 16 September 2019, it found a serious risk of genocidal actions recurring and that Myanmar is failing in its obligation to prevent genocide. This appears at tab two of your folder. The UN mission came to that conclusion following an exhaustive two-year investigation by three distinguished jurists. The chair was Mr. Marzuki Darusman, Indonesia's former attorney general. Another member was Ms. Radhika Kumaraswamy, the former chair of the Sri Lanka Human Rights Commission, who was also the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women and UN Special Representative for Children and Armed Conflict. The other member, Mr. Christopher Sidotti, was Australia's former Human Rights Commissioner. The mission's mandate was established by the UN Human Rights Council in March 2017. It was assisted by experts and advisors from the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Its investigation followed rigorous UN guidelines for best practices. Over two years, more than 1,000 victims and witnesses were interviewed, and a vast amount of documents, photographs, and videos were analyzed. Myanmar refused to cooperate with or give access to the mission, but that did not prevent a thorough and impartial investigation. The UN mission's conclusion on Myanmar's continuing genocidal intent and the serious risk of genocidal actions recurring must be given significant weight. This is a finding of fact by an independent inquiry authorized by the United Nations. As the court found in Bosnia versus Serbia in respect of the UN report on Srebrenica, the care taken in preparing the report, its comprehensive sources, and the independence of those responsible for its preparation all lend considerable authority to it. Mr. President, a deeper appreciation of what led the UN mission to this conclusion requires an examination of the wider context of the current situation to which I now turn. The Rohingya are a distinct ethnic and religious group 
in Myanmar's Rakhine state, where they have had a historical presence for centuries. This region is depicted in the map at tab three of your folders. As set out in the application, the genocidal acts against them have been a long time in the making. They incubated in toxic hate speech on Facebook and Twitter, by which Myanmar demonized an entire group as illegal Bengali immigrants, terrorists and jihadists, maggots and dogs. A Muslim invasion posing an existential threat to Burmese racial purity. The UN mission has pointed to the systematic oppression and persecution of the Rohingya from birth to death, and their extreme vulnerability as a consequence of state policies and practices implemented over decades. Beginning in 2016, there was a dramatic escalation of this persecution in successive waves of what Myanmar described as clearance operations. This was ostensibly against the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army, but it targeted the Rohingya as such for collective destruction. The UN mission observed that there was not the least effort to make any distinction between ARSA fighters and civilians, or to specifically target a military objective or identify and repel an immediate threat. Everyone was a target and no one was spared. Mothers, infants, pregnant women, the old and infirmed all fell victim to the ruthless campaign. The targeting of women and girls for rape, gang rape, and other forms of sexual violence, as well as the targeting and impact on children in general has been shocking. It was in this context that the fact-finding mission first concluded in September 2018 that the factors allowing the inference of genocidal intent are present. It did so based on the exacting requirements of Article 2 of the Convention, namely the intention to destroy the protected group in whole or in part as such. It specifically noted that destruction is understood to mean physical or biological destruction rather than the disbandment or expulsion of the group. It found that the actions of those who orchestrated the attacks on the Rohingya read as a veritable checklist of what a state would have done had it wished to destroy the target group in whole or in part. The UN mission was so convinced of its conclusion that it took an extraordinary step. It recommended that named senior generals of the Myanmar military, the so-called Tatmadaw, should be investigated and prosecuted in an international criminal tribunal for genocide. Those names included Myanmar's commander-in-chief, Senior General Min Aung Hlaing. The UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Myanmar, Yang Hee Lee of Korea, similarly concluded that the Commander-in-Chief and other senior Tatmadaw generals should be held accountable for genocide in Rakhine. The UN Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide, Mr. Adama Dieng of Senegal, also concluded that Rohingya Muslims have been killed, tortured, raped, burnt alive, and humiliated solely because of who they are. The intent of the perpetrators was to cleanse northern Rakhine state of their existence, possibly even to destroy the Rohingya as such, which, if proven, would constitute the crime of genocide. While time does not allow for a complete analysis of the UN mission's massive report, it is instructive to focus on two specific genocidal acts under Article 2 of the Convention. 
The first is killing members of the Rohingya group under paragraph A. There are detailed accounts of corroborated mass killings. In hundreds of villages, men, women, and children were killed as Tatmadaw soldiers systematically moved from house to house, pulling people out of their homes and executing them, or shooting them inside their houses, or as they left their houses, often in front of family members. The mission also verified a pattern of people, including babies and children, being pushed or thrown into burning houses by Tatmadaw soldiers. The mission found that Rohingya children were specifically targeted. A woman described how at Kian Chanong village, to give but one example, soldiers beat her youngest child. He was one and a half years old, she testified. He died as a result of the beating. My four-year-old son's hand was being held by my daughter, who was also stabbed in the head. He started crying, and then the military stabbed him, and he died. Another survivor from Kiet Yo Pin recounted how a pregnant woman in labor, assisted by a midwife and female relatives, were all killed by soldiers, including the newborn baby. Mr. President, the second category of Myanmar's genocidal acts under Article 2 of the Convention is causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group under paragraph B. I refer in particular to what the UN mission described as widespread sexual violence intended to contribute to the destruction of the Rohingya as a group and the breakdown of the Rohingya way of life. In the landmark 1998 Akayesu judgment, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda made clear that when committed with the requisite intent, rape and sexual violence constitute genocide in the same way as any other act. It stressed that this was one of the worst ways of inflicting harm because it resulted in physical and psychological destruction of Tutsi women, their families, and their communities. Destruction of the spirit, of the will to live, and of life itself. The UN mission found that in Myanmar, there was a notable pattern of mass gang rape involving multiple perpetrators and multiple victims in the same incident. These crimes were committed in open public spaces, in front of family and neighbors, within forested areas near the village, in large houses within the village, and during detention in military and police compounds. A survivor who had been gang raped with her sister testified how a Tatmadaw soldier told them, we are going to kill Rohingya. We will rape you. This is not your country. In one case, a large number of interviewees saw dead bodies of women and girls en route to Bangladesh, who they thought had been raped because the bodies were naked and large amounts of blood were visible between their legs. A survivor who was eight months pregnant at the time testified that they stamped and kicked my stomach with their boots and then stripped me naked. I was blindfolded and hung by my wrists from a tree. I was raped nine times. My mother found me in the evening. My unborn baby died. Mr. President, in its 1951 advisory opinion, the court recalled that genocide shocks the conscience of humankind. It is devastating to recount these unspeakable crimes, but the voices of the survivors convey the immense gravity of the request 
that is now before you. These are the circumstances leading the UN mission to conclude that Myanmar's genocidal intention is ongoing and unabated. In its September 2019 report at tab two of your folder, it stated as follows. The mission has identified seven indicators from which it inferred genocidal intent to destroy the Rohingya people as such, all based on the consideration of indicators of genocidal intent in international case law. First, the Tatmadaw's extreme brutality during its attacks on the Rohingya. Second, the organized nature of the Tatmadaw's destruction. Third, the enormity and nature of the sexual violence perpetrated against women and girls during the clearance operations. Fourth, the insulting, derogatory, racist, and exclusionary utterances of Myanmar officials and others prior, during, and after the clearance operations. Fifth, the existence and discriminatory plans and policies, such as the citizenship law and the national verification card process, as well as the government's efforts to clear, raise, confiscate, and build on land in a manner that sought to change the demographic and ethnic composition of Rakhine State, the goal being to reduce the proportion of Rohingya. Sixth, the government's tolerance for public rhetoric of hatred and contempt for the Rohingya. And seventh, the state's failure to investigate and prosecute gross violations of international human rights law and serious violations of international humanitarian law, both as they were occurring and after they occurred. These seven indicators also allow the mission to infer that the state did not object and in fact endorsed the Tatmadaw's clearance operations and the manner in which they were conducted. As indicated at tab two of your folder, the UN mission further concluded that every one of these indicators is linked to the acts or omissions of Myanmar state organs, including the military, other security forces, ministries, legislative bodies, the UEHRD, and other civilian institutions. Collectively, they demonstrate a pattern of conduct that infers genocidal intent on the part of the state to destroy the Rohingya in whole or in part as a group. For reasons explained in its 2018 report, there is no reasonable conclusion to draw other than the inference of genocidal intent from the state's pattern of conduct. The UE HRD, one of the state organs linked to the genocide, is the Union Enterprise for Humanitarian Assistance in Rakhine State. According to the UN fact-finding mission, it has been responsible for large-scale confiscation of Rohingya land and the bulldozing of burned Rohingya villages, which is likely to have destroyed criminal evidence. Its chairperson is Myanmar's agent in this case. Mr. President, the map on the screen at tab six of your folder is satellite imagery analysis by the UN Operational Satellite Application Program published in October 2018. It shows that in northern Rakhine state, the Tatmadaw had destroyed or partially destroyed 392 villages, comprising 37,700 homes and other structures. But Mr. President, not all Rohingya villages have been destroyed, at least not yet. Some 600,000 Rohingya remain in Myanmar. They are in urgent need of protection. As the fact-finding mission concluded just a few weeks ago, they remain under serious risk of genocide. Mr. President, distinguished members of the court, 
This concludes my presentation. Mr. Lowenstein will now describe further evidence of Myanmar's genocidal intention. I thank you for your kind attention and ask that you call him to the podium.